mountainous, beautiful, and full of creepy goatmen and skinwalkers. The Ozarks is a place you just have to see. But after hearing this compilation of disturbing stories from the Ozarks, you might want to check the place out on YouTube instead. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails if you want to see an oddly terrifying close-up of a stingray eating a fish. That's some pure nightmare fuel. Enjoy this compilation of all the Ozark stories I could find in the Unexplained Encounters archive, and be sure to send me your scary stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org. We're still looking for a few more trucker stories. Remember, you can listen to this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcasting app. Just search for EerieCast. Now, let's begin. The Howler, from Sneeves0426. Hi, my name is Sam, and I live in the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas. I've lived here all my life, and I've been hunting in these mountains since I was a boy with my father. I'm also a heavy believer in the supernatural and in cryptids. Dogmen, Bigfoot, Skinwalkers, and Wendigo. These have gotten me intrigued in the superstitious, but here in Arkansas, we have a legend, and I'm sure you've heard of a legend here, and let me tell you, this legend is very, very real. This is the story of my encounter with the infamous Ozark Howler. It was a cold, misty night in the mountains of the Ozark landscape. My father and I were gathering some firewood for the family. We lived in a cabin that we built ourselves, with my dad being brought up in these mountains by my grandfather and his by my great-grandfather. Our family consisted of my stepmother and my two younger siblings. I was the oldest of my two siblings. I'm currently 21 and own a couple of firearms, but back then we hunted with an 1870 antique Winchester repeater and a Krag Jorgensen rifle, or better known as the bolt-action rifle that was passed down by my grandfather and was used to hunt game back when trapping was a big thing in the States. Now, we use these weapons as a token of our appreciation to our ancestors. I also use a standard hunting knife and a crossbow whenever I go hunting. We go out hunting often, and we haven't seen much this past winter. We'd see the occasional bear or the occasional mountain lion, but not many deer this season, which was odd, as they are abundant in these mountains. While we were gathering some firewood outside, we heard a howl in the distance, I've heard these howls before, and mostly I assume it to be some coyotes, a fox, or maybe a lone cougar. It was also much colder than normal this night, and as we were chopping the firewood, my father looked at me with sweat dripping down his face. He said, How's it going over there, champ? I responded, Just fine, Dad. It's a lot colder than normal tonight. What do you say we go hunting for game soon? The kids are probably hungry. Yeah, I think we should. We don't want to keep the family waiting. So we went on inside the cabin to gather our weapons. I took my Winchester repeater and my crossbow, and my father took his Krag Jorgensen rifle and his pump-action shotgun. We let my stepmom know we were going to go hunting. Then we set off into the cold, wintry night. We decided to take a trail that was all too familiar to us to see if we could catch ourselves a big buck or a doe, which would be lucky for us. I was walking through the snow, listening closely to anything that could be lurking in these woods. Luckily, it was a clear night, and the moon was full, so I could see ahead of me. In these mountains, we had all sorts of encounters, ranging from bison to cougars, but this time it felt different. The woods were eerily quiet, I felt like something was watching me from the tree line. All I could hear was the beating of my heartbeat and the sounds of our footsteps in the snow. And then we heard it, a loud, very eerie howl that made my blood go cold. I tried to focus on where the sound came from. I looked over at my father, and even he seemed to be on edge. I asked him, what do you think that was? 
I don't know, son, but I think we should keep it quiet and see if we can down a deer for dinner. I noticed his hands were trembling, but it was a good sight to see that he wanted to keep going. So I went along with him. You see, my dad is fearless, and he's quite a strong man. From what I know, no one would want to mess with him, and to see him want to continue our hunt was a good sign. I kept on listening closely to the sounds that surrounded us as the forest became alive again. Soon, I heard something to our left, and up ahead I saw a deer come into the clearing. It was a buck with a very nice set of antlers. He seemed to have not noticed us yet. I quickly but quietly got my crossbow out because I didn't want to frighten the deer. I loaded the crossbow, took aim at the heart of the big buck, and fired. I saw it pierce through the skin of the buck as he tried to run away with the arrow stuck to his heart. We followed the blood trail to the now injured deer as it was letting out cries of pain. I took out my hunting knife and with an act of mercy, I put it down. After that, we heard something to the right of us. I looked down into the tree line to see if anything was there and I heard a low, deep, guttural growl. I froze in fear. Whatever it was sounded intimidating, but it was odd as in Arkansas, the largest animals around here were bison or bears. Whatever this thing was did not sound like any predator that hunts in the region. My dad picked up the carcass of the dead deer and put it on his shoulders. He signaled me to follow. As we were making our way back to the cabin, I kept hearing heavy footsteps follow us every few meters. I kept looking around to see if I could catch a glimpse of what it was, and then I saw it. To the left of me, I saw a huge shape moving slowly next to us. It was gigantic. It looked like a grizzly bear to me but it's odd to see anything this big in these woods. I signaled my dad to look. He turned around and saw it as well and said quietly to me, Stay close to me. As long as we stay quiet and move quietly, we'll be okay. I nodded my head. We began to sneak our way back to the cabin. We managed to make it back in about 15 minutes. Both my dad and I were on edge as we moved back to the cabin. Along the way, we heard the occasional growl. And a howl. As it seemed to be taunting us. As we moved into the clearing near the cabin, I heard a booming set of footsteps behind me. I turned around to see the same creature, except this time... I could see it clearly. It did look like a grizzly bear, but with horns and eyes glowing a bright crimson blood red. My dad and I screamed as we ran back to the cabin. We made it just in time to close the door as whatever the creature was hit the door with brute force. My dad began to panic, placing the deer down and rushing the kids and my stepmother upstairs. I kept on hearing this creature scratching at the door and every so often it tried to break the door down. It roared so loud my ears began to ring. I decided I was going to try to scare it away. I went upstairs to my bedroom window, opened it up, and got my Winchester ready. I had the massive beast in my sights as I fired at it. After I hit it, it let out a roar and ran back into the woods with the earth shaking behind its every step. Everything went quiet again after that. I ran downstairs and looked outside to see nothing but large footprints in the snow. I opened the door and looked at the damage the creature caused, and all I saw were huge scratch marks. I then went to the footprints left by the creature, and to my surprise, there was no blood, even though I'm sure I shot it. It was only after this event that I discovered the legend of the Ozark Howler. Occasionally, we do hear its howl at night, but my dad and I have learned to respect it. I haven't seen the beast to this day, but 
Ozark Howler, let's never meet again. The Forest from John G. I live in a house in Oklahoma out in the Ozarks. In my time here, since I moved here in 2005 so me and my wife could live close to her parents, I've encountered many things, whether it be supernatural or not. I've seen flashing lights zip through the sky and heard strange howls during morning hikes. Just last week, when my wife drove to the store in town with our two kids, they saw huge muddy prints on the porch when they got back, and when she got inside, the dogs were shaken. But the scariest encounter I had was when my brother was visiting us from Utah. He, his wife, and their three kids stayed for the week. It was supposed to be a fun week of hiking, hunting, and fishing on our vast property. Our fairly big house was packed with five kids and four adults, so it's safe to say outside time was much less stressful for me. Nothing happened the first three nights, but on the fourth, things started to feel off. When me, my brother, my son, and his eldest son went hunting, something felt weird. I walked faster and faster until I realized I was jogging slowly and I was ahead of our group. Everyone asked why I was rushing like that. I just responded by saying, I, uh, I don't want to get to the spot too late, that's all. Deep down, I knew I was scared of something watching us. I swear I could hear breathing outside our own. We got to our spot that was perfect for hunting. It was on the far side of the property, so there were more deer here. Three hours later, and we had nothing. It was getting dark, and my son and nephew were bored, so they began to skip rocks in the creek. It was then when we realized the whole time it was very quiet. It was so silent, it was weird and scary to us. My brother made an excuse that we should go home to eat, so we began to walk back, defeated. In front of us as we walked back home, we began to hear a crunch in the woods and a yell so loud it couldn't be human. It sounded like a screaming girl and a bear mixed into one. I tried to tell myself it was just a mountain lion, but just then, I saw it. A large creature ran across the path. I fell back in shock. The thing had long fur, and it was big like a bear with glowing eyes. I would have said it was a bear, but the horns on it told me otherwise. I tried to think of what it was, but I mainly saw its face and some of the body. We ran home, but I kept telling myself it was a ram or something, but deep down, I knew what I saw was a monster. We were almost home when we heard something running behind us along the trail. It was so fast, we nearly had no time to react. We jumped out of the way, and my brother tried to take a shot at it. I fired at it as well, but the creature ran away into the forest. We recovered quickly and ran inside the house, unaware that everyone else was watching from the back porch after hearing the gunshots. We ran inside, locking the doors and closing the windows, all while trying to explain the situation to everyone in there. My youngest niece, who was only eight at the time, freaked out. She ran to her older brothers and my kids. Together, they all huddled up scared. My eldest son held his rifle tightly while shaking. After a while, we all sat at the couch trying to forget by watching some TV and playing board games after dinner. But we couldn't think clear. We were all just listening for any sudden moves outside. Our three dogs were also scared out of their minds. Even the two big ones who stay outside were in here after my daughter protested the idea of them sleeping out there with that monster near us. As the evening progressed, one by one, everyone went to sleep until the adults were the only ones awake. We played poker and drank coffee until about 11.30 when our dogs went ballistic, barking and jumping and running around, waking everyone. Then, we heard a crashing sound from the shop outside. We all were terrified. We grabbed our guns, which were at the ready, and ran out there. My son and nephew were in pursuit behind us. 
We fired towards the shop. And then, crash, it came running out. We all fired at it, a rain of bullets hitting it. Yet the creature didn't fall. My brother shot at it too. He knows he hit the side of it. It ran off making noises that sounded like it was running out of air. We all froze. Soon after, my wife and sister-in-law called in my son and nephew. My brother and I decided to see where the thing had went. With our blood pumping, we tracked it, but the tracks quickly ended at one of the creeks on our property. We went back to clean up the shop mess. I was beginning to calm down until I saw the mess of my tools all across the floor, and the old truck I'd been trying to restore had been dented. We cleaned up what we could, then we went inside to sleep, all the while hearing the howls again. That really scared me, but the howls were different. It sounded hurt and sad. Soon the howls were more distant. I almost felt bad for it, but then I remembered that it tried to kill me and my family, and it ruined months of work on that old truck. The next morning was normal, and we didn't mention it. That morning, I went down the dirt road leading to my neighbor's. I asked him if he'd heard anything last night. He said, yeah, in a shaky voice. He then pointed to a hole in the ground. That thing killed my dog. We talked for a little while. He explained the creature came around nine o'clock and attacked his dog. He scared it away with a shotgun, but it was too late. I went back home once we were done talking to fix up my shop some more and break the news to my daughter that the neighbor's dog, who she was fond of, had died. The next few days were normal. I thought of the events of that night less and less, and when my brother's family left, things went back to normal. Before I knew it, my week off from work was over. As the years went by, I forgot about the thing more and more, until now, five years later, because my brother is coming to visit again in a few weeks with the family. I was happy for a little bit, thinking about being with my brother and my son who's coming back from college for winter break, and then I was reminded about that night. It was years ago, but thinking about it gives me chills. I guess the upside is that it's going to make a good conversation near the fire when they do get here. A Haunted High School in the Ozarks From J.D. A co-worker told me this unforgettable story about his time in high school. I'm going to write this from his perspective. Central High School in Springfield, Missouri is haunted. I know what you're thinking. Every kid says their school is haunted. But my story is different. I saw it. Central was actually the first high school in Springfield. The original brick building with its tower still stands, but has now expanded with many new wings. We'd all heard the stories about the steam tunnels that connected the buildings and the supposed hangings, but far more compelling was the story of the deadly principal who would whip troublesome students to death. That would have happened long ago when Springfield was a small town and not the Queen City of the Ozarks. We had heard the rumors, the stories that were likely exaggerated, but being high schoolers, we knew we had to do one thing, be at the school late at night. I was the one who came up with the idea that we needed to join the drama class. They were preparing a performance of South Pacific, and as I explained to my group of friends, the way to get in would be to join the class as stagehands, stay to clean up after the performance, and then just stay. And that was what we did. Well, only a couple of us actually got onto the crew, but after everyone else had left, letting the others in was simple. We split up into three pairs, myself and Sarah, Rich and Paul, and Michelle and Dan. We didn't have flashlights, and this was before we had cell phones. 
but the moonlight from the windows and the familiarity of the halls allowed us to get around the school very easily. After about an hour, we began to think perhaps the stories were just stories. We began to make our way to the gymnasium. We started to compare experiences, but everyone said the same thing. They hadn't seen anything, nor heard anything strange. And that's when a chair flew across the gym and slammed into the wall. What the heck? I gasped before I saw something else. Swarms of glittering little things crawling across the floor. They were cockroaches. We'd see cockroaches in the gym on occasion, but usually one or two, not... not hundreds. Let's get out of here! yelled Michelle, and we hurried to the nearest exit, a stairway leading up to the second floor. It wasn't until we got upstairs that we realized that going upstairs probably wasn't the best course of action, but the cockroaches didn't seem to follow us there. As we stood next to a classroom, catching our breath, we heard loud footsteps down the hall. All of us backed up against the wall, trying to let whatever this was just pass by. As the loud, plodding footsteps came nearer, our tension grew higher. Oh, screw this, Rich said, and he ran into a classroom, Sarah following quickly after him. The door slammed shut behind them. Guys, I called. I almost didn't notice that the footsteps had stopped. Suddenly, we heard them scream and something slammed against the wall. And then something else hit it. They kept on screaming. Paul pulled at the door, but the handle was stuck. Finally, after a few minutes of them screaming and something hitting the wall, it opened. We entered the classroom. All the desks and chairs were knocked over and some had clearly been hitting the walls. How they'd gone that far was a mystery, as they were pretty heavy. We found Sarah crouched in a corner, crying and babbling incoherently, a puddle of moisture underneath her. Rich, on the other hand, was stumbling toward the window. Get him! I called, and Dan ran towards Rich, grabbing him. Let me go. Just let me jump. Let me die. Rich cried. G guys this is enough, I said. We need to get out of here. Michelle and Paul helped Sarah up, and helping Dan with Rich, we made our way back into the hall. As we stepped into the hallway, all at once, all the doors slammed shut. Then they all opened again and slammed again. Screw this, Michelle yelled, and she and Paul began hurrying down the stairs, supporting Sarah between them. Dan ran after them, and I pulled Rich after me. The cockroaches downstairs had seemingly dispersed as we made our way to the nearest exit. Pushing at the door, nothing seemed to happen. Come on, push it! Michelle yelled, and Paul, Dan, and I struck the door together, forcing it open. We pulled Sarah and Rich outside, and as we made our way to the cars, we heard the door behind us slam shut. Dan helped Rich to his car while Michelle and Paul brought Sarah to the car they'd arrived in. As for me, I ran to my own car. As I was about to climb inside, I happened to look back at the school, looking at the tower. There, in the top room, was a window. And very clearly, I could see the outline of someone looking out the window directly at us as we made our escape. It was then I realized the most horrifying thing of all, that we knew there was something in the high school. It knew we knew, and we had to go back to class on Monday. Encounter with a Bear From LaDonna Steele This happened in 2015 in November. We had bought a piece of land in Highland, Arkansas, for those of you who don't know Arkansas, Highland is between Ash Flat and Hardy near the Missouri border, just under Thayer, 
It is extremely rugged and woody, with jagged cliffs and hills that would make a billy goat say ouch. Well, our land hadn't been cleared of trees, vines, or rocks ever. It was as wild as you can get. Plenty of copperhead snakes, too. We set up our tent to stay the night and got a good-sized fire going. It was a little chilly. As soon as we settled down for the night, it got really nice and quiet. The partial moon was beautiful, just what you camp for. I couldn't sleep, but my husband was out like a light, so I got up and went outside the tent. I tended the fire a bit and whatnot, trying to get sleepy enough. Now, I'm a trucker, so wild things never scare me unless they're bigger than me. I'm five foot two and about 160 pounds. Strong, like stocky strong. You have to be strong if you drive a truck, and willing to go the extra mile if you have to. About 1.30 in the morning, I hear something coming through the knee-high leaves. Something big. Humans sound different when they walk through leaves. So do deer. But this was large and bulky, and it didn't care if you heard it or not. Now, me and Hubby had only brought a 22 long rifle with us. We hadn't taken into account that we might run into a predator able to kill us. Way too much city living. This thing is completely black, and moving like it has no cares in the world. It could see me, but I couldn't see it fully. Fire is a great thing sometimes. What I mean by that is you can't see anything past the glow of the fire. It's like a wall of light and you're blind. It moves past me to my right at exactly 25 feet out, just out of reach of my small crappy flashlight, dang it. I think to myself, as I'm wanting that spotlight we left at the house, I didn't think we would need something you could flag a 747 down with. I have an iron rod I was stirring the fire with in one hand, the crappy flashlight in the other, turning to face the invisible stalker as it circles to the rear of our tent. I walk to the sound of its feet going through the leaves. I'm trying to stay away enough to be able to fight it if I had to. I still don't have a clue what it is. My flashlight beam lands on its eye shine, great blue eyes. I know from hunting deer, they have red eye shine, and most animals have a red or yellow eye shine. 100% of the time, blue means cows or horses or bears. Now this eye shine was a brilliant, beautiful blue. So I run at it, saying, Ha! Ha! In as deep a voice as I can muster, just a step or two, stomping. It then stands up on its back two legs, and I kid you not, it sniffs me. Now real fear is kicking in like a mother. I now know exactly what it is, and we only have a twenty-two. Shaking, I stand my ground letting it know I will not back down. It walks off into the fallen trees and brush where I have no hope of seeing it for the rest of the night. That's right, it stayed out of sight, but it stayed there making sounds like sniffing and grunting all night until it was almost dawn. I guess that's the best I've been scared of any animal on earth. I think all he wanted was the hamburgers we bought, as fast food is a weakness of most bears. I thank God he didn't want those stupid things enough to maul me to death. Do not bring food on overnights in the Ozarks, people. It ain't worth your life. The following story is from an episode from last year, titled, Five Scary Stories to Fall Asleep To. It matches this theme, so I've decided to add it. They told me they'd leave you alone. From Pity K. They told me they'd leave you alone. I remembered this story when I was driving home late the other night, and just thinking about it really creeped me out. This didn't happen to me, but I did hear it from my ex-girlfriend's grandma years ago, about a friend of hers. We'll call her grandma, Grandma Z. Z worked as a therapeutic masseuse at a spa in a nice little town in northwest Arkansas. 
To give you a bit of an idea of what kind of person Z was, she lived in a little stone cottage with a shrine to a Hindu holy man as its centerpiece, and she carried pipe tobacco in her Volvo to sprinkle on roadkill. Now, she claimed it was a Native American ritual to help ferry the animal spirit into the next life, or something along those lines. She was a nice enough woman, but obviously a bit eccentric. That being said, she seemed sincere and a little more than creeped out when she told us her story. Another masseuse that Z was close to at the spa, I'll call her M, arrived at work one day in the middle of the week in a haggard state. M was a young woman in her early 30s. She was friendly, and most of the time she had a bubbly personality. But on that day, she was aloof, downcast, and had bags under her eyes. Z noticed this the moment she walked in the door, but with work to do, she waited for a better time to ask M if everything was okay. When lunch came around, Z approached her friend and asked what was wrong. M brushed it off initially, saying that nothing was wrong, that she was simply tired. But Z persisted. M began to tear up then, and started to sob. Z embraced her and told her it was going to be all right, that she could share what was on her mind if she needed to. M's sob subsided a little, and she began to speak, but then stopped. What she had to say, she told Z, was too crazy, and Z would never believe her. Z told him that she'd be surprised at what she may or may not find believable. So M composed herself a bit, and then began her story. M, her husband, and young son lived in a house about 20 miles outside of town. The house and the property were beautiful, essentially the couple's dream home. It included plenty of acreage nestled in a valley in the Ozark Mountains, and the house had a huge picture window in the living room, overlooking the valley and the forested mountains beyond. The night before, she'd awakened around 3 o'clock a.m. Nothing had startled her awake, no nightmares, no having to pee, but, but something had definitely awakened her, something that she wasn't aware of just yet. She lay in bed in the dark for a while, listening in the silence, trying to go back to sleep, but she couldn't. She then carefully rolled out of the bed, trying not to wake her husband, and then she made her way through the dark house to the kitchen for a snack. As she walked through the lightless living room, she looked out of the picture window and froze. There was something standing on the deck just outside, a small silhouette outlined in starlight. She studied the shape in wide-eyed fear as it stood motionless on the deck overlooking the valley. It seemed to be looking up. Her shock turned to concern and confusion when she realized what the figure was. It was her eight-year-old son. She quickly flung the sliding door to the deck open and wrapped the boy in her arms, asking, Are you okay, honey? What's wrong? What are you doing out here? I'm... I'm looking at the lights he said. Then he pointed out into the clear night sky. She followed the direction of his finger and saw several orbs of soft red, blue, and orange lights hovering over the valley. They were like bright stars at first, but then they moved slowly, deliberately into a formation. First a line, and then a cross, and then a diamond, and finally something that resembled the Big Dipper. There was nothing natural about their movement. They could not be shooting stars or aircraft. They weren't moving like that. It was like they were some sort of signal, almost as if they were communicating with something or someone. Im released her son from her arms and stood up hypnotized, staring at the lights too, 
as they changed formations and pulsated from dim to bright and back to dim again. Her son tugged on the hem of her nightshirt and said that he was cold. She broke her trance and took her son quickly by the shoulder, leading him inside impatiently. She slid the door closed behind her and locked it, doing her best not to look back out over the valley. She closed the blinds on the big window in the living room and ushered her son into her bedroom to sleep with her and her husband with the lights on. M stopped talking and looked up at Z, who looked back at her with eyes widened in amazement. She began to sob again. Do you want to hear the really crazy part? The reason why this is so, so scary? Z's mouth hung open as she thought about how to respond. Before she could reply, M continued. Her father was a physicist who'd worked at a government lab in New Mexico. He was never able to tell her what exactly he did for reasons of national security, so to say. While working in the Southwest, he'd fallen in love with the region's harsh but beautiful mountains and desert landscapes. After divorcing M's mother and retiring early with a handsome government pension, he bought a small ranch in Arizona. In the summertime, M, then a young girl, would stay with her father at his ranch. It was a very remote property, part of its allure for him. It was in the foothills of some mountains in the desert, but it had access to a water source, and there was a small pond back behind the ranch house, overgrown with tall cattails. Early in the afternoon one summer day, M's father left the ranch to run some errands in the nearest town. It was a brutally hot day, and M did not want to ride in the stifling hot truck, so she begged her father to let her stay so she could swim in the pond. Reluctantly, he agreed. Once her father had left, M put on her bathing suit and made her way down a small path of hot rocks and sand to the pond behind the house. The sky was almost impossibly blue in the clear, torturous Arizona summer heat. A slight breeze rustled the reeds and scrub brush, but it was otherwise silent, as if all the animal life had perished or gone underground to escape the relentless desert heat. As Im rounded the bank of cattails that obscured the pond from the house, she froze at an unexpected encounter. Three tall beings were standing on the opposite side of the pond. They were all identical and stood facing her as she came into view, as if, as if they'd been waiting for her. M couldn't move. Whether that was from pure fear or something else, she couldn't tell. All she could do was stare in horror and disbelief at these things. They stood about seven feet tall, each one completely indistinguishable from the other, as if they were clones or triplets or mirrored images of each other. They were vaguely humanoid, two unusually long and skinny arms that ended in spindly hands with long fingers, two long and thin legs, slender elongated torsos, and skinnier necks. Their heads were long but proportional to the height and build of these things, whatever they were. They had ruddy tan and completely hairless skin and wore what seemed to be blue skin-tight jumpsuits, but the strangest and most awful aspect of these things were their faces. They were completely featureless save for the eyes, no mouth, no ears, no nose, just two somehow human-looking, but somehow not human-looking, eyes set into the blank, tanned plane of their faces, staring dispassionately and motionlessly at him. She blinked once, and soon found herself lying on the floor of her father's living room, right on her back. She was wrapped in the towel she'd taken with her to the pond, as if she'd been swaddled in it. The sun had gotten significantly lower in the sky. 
She could tell by the way it slanted in through the yellow blinds of the windows at a long angle. She set up, confused, and beginning to panic. She heard the ticking of the old grandfather clock and looked over at it. The time read 5 p.m. She'd somehow lost nearly three hours of time. How? How's that possible? How had she even gotten back to the house? Just as strangely, she was completely dry. Not a bead of sweat had gathered on her even though her father's house lacked air conditioning and was sickly hot. Her father arrived not long afterward, pulling his truck down the long driveway of the ranch. When he entered the house with his sack of groceries, he found Em in a state of distress. She told him in a panicked frenzy what she'd seen, what had happened to her at the pond, how she'd somehow lost three hours of her life. The old physicist stared coldly into the distance, waiting for his daughter to finish the story, then told her, But they told me they'd leave you alone. M was shaking and began to cry again. Z held her and she buried her face in Z's arms. That's why I'm afraid, she said. I'm afraid that they came back for my son. Wendigo of Missouri from Jin. I cannot recall the exact time of this event, but I think I was about 12 years old then. I was with my family at the Lake of the Ozarks in Missouri. We tend to go out there about every two years, pretty much a family tradition. So one year while we were there, we went to a different spot than usual. Normally we would stay in a rental condo by the lake, but this time we decided we'd go camping instead. Of course, me being afraid of the woods freaked out a little bit. I absolutely despised thick woods, especially ones that could potentially consist of bears and other wildlife. When the day came for us to leave, I said goodbye to my pets and my friend who was going to care for them while I was gone. I got in our car, waved goodbye, and we drove off. About two hours into the drive, I fell asleep. When I woke up, I heard the car coming to a stop. We'd driven into a gas station practically in the middle of nowhere. Everyone was going inside to use the bathroom, but me, on the other hand, I stayed in the car. As I lay there in the passenger seat, a wave of unease set over me. I looked out the window of the car, and I saw this tall shadow just disappearing into the trees. I figured it was some sort of moose or bear, minding its own business. About three hours later, we'd finally arrived at the campsite. I got out and saw that we had an amazing view of the lake, and the mountains around. We all helped unpack the luggage we had brought with us. Since it was already dinner time, we sat down together at a metal bench next to our tent while my aunt and my mother cooked us all a meal. As I sat and waited for the food to get done, I noticed a cute little rabbit by the forest line. I smiled, watching it chew on some grass, but with a blur, a tall figure passed over the rabbit, and the rabbit was gone. It happened so fast, I was oblivious to what that thing was, but still I excused it like before. Maybe it was a bear, even a hawk. Heck, the rabbit probably just ran off. I turned back around to eat and didn't mention this to anyone, mostly because they probably wouldn't believe that the thing I saw was that fast, if I'd seen anything at all. Later on, after dinner, we all sat around the campfire telling scary stories. When it came time for my turn, I had no ideas so I excused myself to my tent to go to bed. Honestly, I really was tired from that five-hour trip. As I lay on my air mattress, something smelled absolutely horrible. I began looking around the tent, and to my horror, I found a dead raccoon resting behind my mattress. I yelped, trying to get away from the dead thing. I went back out to the campfire to tell my mom about this raccoon. She decided to use some gloves to carry it to the trees. After this occurrence, I really didn't want to sleep anymore, and feared that whatever had killed the poor thing was still nearby. I did eventually fall asleep, 
peacefully resting my overwhelmed mind. What must have been around half an hour later, I suddenly woke up and I felt as if someone was watching me. I noticed that all the sounds of nature sounded muted. I looked at the tent door and realized it was open, but it hadn't been before. At first, I was pretty scared to look, but after gaining some confidence, I glanced outside the tent. What I saw, I will honestly never forget. Standing there was a dark figure, probably around eight feet tall. I looked up at its face, but only saw a deer skull and antlers. I screamed as loud as possible, trying to alert everyone about the danger. I kept screaming, not letting my eyes off the creature. After about five seconds, it ran off into the forest. In that instant, my parents came running out of the tent with the most worried looks on their faces. I was in tears at that point, breaking down into their arms. The next day, we immediately left that place, returning home. Of course, I didn't tell my parents what I actually saw. They would never believe me. Instead, I said that a bear had been trying to get inside my tent. Let's just say I'm never going there again. At least, not any time soon. There's something wrong with the deer in the Ozarks. From Unknown Hiker. I've been hiking the Ozarks for years now. I'm a 34-year-old guy, kind of obsessed with my health and fitness. It started as an insecurity I had in high school. After all, I'd been an overweight teen. Feeling motivated and living in the country, I began hiking and camping with my dad. In a year's time, I'd lost the weight I wanted to lose, but I couldn't stop myself from spending most of my time outdoors after that. Nothing beats it. I feel like I get a sort of high from hiking. A month after I turned 24, my dad passed away from cancer. I think that's when it really stuck with me. A hobby I was extremely passionate about turned into a lifestyle once dad was gone. It was the thing that had brought us closest, too. Anyway, I'm not here to write you a sob story or an autobiography. I'm here to tell you that there's something incredibly wrong with the deer in the Ozarks as of September 2021. The Ozarks is prime hunting ground, so the deer around here spook rather easily. They'll run off before you even catch sight or scent of them, but lately I've been walking up on them by accident. But then it got extremely weird. This happened when I went on a camping trip alone on September 5th. I'd packed up my campsite early that morning, and I got right back on the hiking trail. Not 30 minutes later, I nearly laid bricks in my pants when I suddenly looked up, and where there had been a clear trail before now stood a big buck. He was grunting and huffing and kicking up the dirt. Now, I assumed it somehow hadn't noticed me, so I tried to shoo it away by shouting at it. Oddly enough, the buck suddenly stopped moving, and it wouldn't budge. It wouldn't look in my direction. I tried again shouting even louder than before, but no matter what I did, I couldn't get the buck's attention at all. Now this thing was built big, and it had an intimidating rack on it, but curiosity overwhelmed my smarter side. So I reached out and touched it. A stupid idea, I know. I kid you not, this buck once again did not budge as I flat out laid my palm on its side. My hand was just under its ribs where its abdomen was. At first, I was kind of amazed. How exciting to touch a wild deer, let alone a big trophy buck, up close like this. But my excitement quickly died when I felt something underneath my hand. There was something underneath the deer's skin, something slithering around. It felt like well, snakes. Whatever was going on in there, it felt like four or five inch wide snakes or worms, or something, writhing about in disgusting circles. Even I thought that the poor thing had worms for a second before realizing that I don't recall there being worms that big on this planet. 
Maybe his organs were tossing about somehow, I wondered. But that didn't make sense at all either. Yet, it was all I could come up with. The only thing that made sense was that its intestines were moving. But how and why? Then it hit me. What if this was a side effect of wasting disease or something else? I yanked my hand away from the buck so fast, regretting doing something as dumb as touching an animal acting strangely. It could be rabid or diseased, you idiot, I told myself. Quickly, I fumbled about my bag with my other hand and poured hand sanitizer on the hand that had touched the deer. After vigorously scrubbing my hand, I looked up. I'd looked away for maybe 20 or 30 seconds. I nearly screamed. The buck's face was inches from my own, his mouth wide open, and a deep, almost inaudible grumbling sound was coming from within his throat. The creature's breath smelled of decay and death. Inside its mouth were these tumor-like growths, and at the tops of them, the flesh had turned dark gray, nearly black. I then noticed the rest of the buck's body hadn't shifted. Instead, the buck's neck had bent to the side to place its face close to mine in an unnatural, almost painful way. I scrambled backward and picked myself up, the deer did not move or follow me. Holding my breath as if I could still smell that stench, I ran past the deer quickly, watching it as I moved up the trail. And even then, it didn't move. It never moved again for as long as I could still see it. For the next few hours, I walked. I passed what was supposed to be my second camping site for the weekend hike, and instead headed toward the third and last of the campsites, despite how exhausted I was. The image of that deer, the sensation of the things in its gut, moving around like a ball of giant worms, the smell of its innards like it had long been rotting from the inside, these things haunted me, and I wanted to get as far from that deer before sleeping as possible. It took me a few more hours after passing the second campsite before I made it to the third. My legs were killing me, even with the several ten-minute breaks I'd taken on my way down here. Luckily, the remainder of the evening was peaceful. I ate some cliff bars, downed a little too much water, and watched the sunset. A half hour after it lowered completely from the sky, I slinked into my tent and basically collapsed into my sleeping bag. I have no idea how long I slept before my eyes shot open. The sound of approaching footsteps was apparent, even within the cacophony of cricket songs and wind through the trees. These were slow, heavy, but graceful steps on dirt and rock. The embers of my fire still glowed from my fire pit, and I was soon able to see a faint shadow cast on the tent walls as the nighttime invader walked between the tent and the embers. It was a deer, this time a doe. I watched her silhouette continue further into my campsite, closer to my tent. Her gait seemed weird right away. She didn't appear to be walking cautiously. Instead, she walked deliberately, if that makes sense. She placed her hoof ahead of herself and put her full weight into it without hesitation. Her head did not dart to the side, her ears did not flinch or turn to examine her surroundings. She seemed robotic, as if she were moving automatically. Until she stopped. All four hooves were now planted firmly on the ground. She stopped moving completely then. I watched for a few minutes figuring she would eventually move on. Nope. Just before I shouted at her to get her to leave, I saw the shadow of her head turn. But from my perspective, I could not tell if she had turned toward me or the opposite way. However, something told me I knew that answer already. My heart sank when I heard that deep grumbling sound come again. 
the same thing I had heard when that buck had opened its mouth. This time, it was louder. Was this doe infected too? With whatever that parasite or disease was. Perhaps she was further along with the infection than the buck had been. Suddenly, a disgustingly heavy and wet sound thudded to the ground below the doe. I lay there in disbelief. There's no way I just heard that. What did she just throw up? Sounded like an entire organ came out of her. Deep in thought and bewilderment, it caught me off guard when only moments later, I felt something slither under my right arm. I jumped up, shouting a curse and looking down at the tent floor. There was, in fact, a large, worm-like bulge where my arm had been. Whatever it was, it slithered along under the tent floor until it popped out the other side and slithered away. Thank God it had been outside, blocked by my tent. I'm no idiot. I'm sure you're thinking exactly what I was thinking then. The things slithering around inside the deer's belly had come right out of her mouth and crawled towards me. I stayed up all night with that deer just outside, standing there like a rotting statue. A 34-year-old man too scared to face a sick deer and too scared to encounter whatever slimy and worm-like parasite had been infecting them. Eventually, though, sleep took hold. I woke up in a sitting position at the corner of my tent. The first beams of sunrise came glistening through the canopy. Slowly, I unzipped the tent flap. Just outside on the ground lay the doe. She was dead. I threw on my shoes and stepped carefully outside to take a closer look. Her body was stiff and straight-legged. Her eyes were gone, and her abdomen looked impossibly thin and empty, like her innards had been vacuumed away from the outside. Somehow, there were no fluids of any sort to be found on the ground. The doe had become a dry, flattened, empty corpse. I packed up my things, and I left quickly. I kept my tent in a separate trash bag that I'd brought. That slithering thing had touched it, so I was planning on burning my tent when I got home. The hike to the end of the trail was safe and easy. I wasn't as sore as I'd expected to be that morning from my extended hike the day prior. My truck started just fine, and no alien parasites or infected deer attacked me. I simply drove home. I called my mom when I got back to tell her about this crazy crap. I struggled to produce a fake laugh to help me cope with it. I haven't gone back to the Ozarks to hike. Nowadays I keep my camping and hiking activity away from that region. My drives to new trails are a bit more extensive, but it's worth it to stay safe. Lord knows what's going on with the deer in the Ozarks. Don't hunt alone in the Ozarks. From that dude second. Before we get into what happened, I'll give some background info. I grew up in the southern part of the Ozark Mountains, spending most of my free time working on the farm or hunting and trapping. Now, you occasionally see things or hear things you can't explain, but most things you can brush off as coyotes, or even the stray mountain lion. At the time of the first encounter, I was 16. It was a chillier November evening, and I was out hunting on my family's farm north of Hector, Arkansas. The spot I was hunting had an old logging road running down into the ravine, with a small hill behind me and a cliff face to my right. So darkness started to fall, and I finally got a deer with my muzzle loader. Anyone who has ever shot a muzzle loader can verify nothing ever hangs around after you shoot it. I instantly pulled out my phone to let the guys know I got one when my arm hair began to rise. 
the deepest growl or yell bellowed from behind me as I pressed send. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Whatever it was, it was on two legs, and it was coming closer, but there shouldn't have been anyone for another two hills. This creature began to sniff before growling again. Hastily, I reloaded the muzzle loader and shouted, This is my farm. Leave or I'll shoot. It growled this time at the base of my tree. Darkness had enveloped the entire block of woods now. I was trapped with a flip phone and a muzzle loader against something that I couldn't see. I could only hope the other guys were on the way. Then I felt the ladder bending slightly, as if it was testing its weight. I pointed my flip phone light down, and I saw two red eyes clearly. However, the lights from my family's side by side lit up the hill, and the creature ran down into the ravine as Levi and the others pulled up. After a few months, some weird things happened in the area before it finally went quiet. Less than a week later, one of the locals went missing along with his dog in the same area. To my knowledge, he still has not been located. For the next two years, I never hunted that area again. Please, never hunt alone in the Ozarks, because what you can't see is more terrifying than what you can. Goatman in the Ozarks from Daniel B. This encounter took place during Easter weekend. My dad wanted to spend Easter with my grandmother, who lived by herself on a small cottage on some farmlands in the Ozarks in Missouri. Her place was surrounded by a large forest. Whenever we'd go visit my grandma, she would always tell us about the strange noises she would hear coming from the forest at night. We got there one late afternoon on Saturday, and me and my dad shared a few drinks together before we all headed off to bed to get ready for the egg hunt the next day. Around one in the morning, I woke up to use the bathroom. I headed downstairs to do my business. After I finished, I made my way back from the bathroom before stopping as I heard my dad call out for me. I went in the direction of the voice and noticed that it sounded like it was coming from outside. I began to make my way to the front door before noticing something that stopped me right in my tracks. There on the couch was my dad, who had a few empty beer bottles on the floor around him, but was very much blacked out. Despite this, the voice of my father came again, calling out my name. It sounded off somehow. It sounded like someone recorded my dad's voice and played it over with a modifier to it. It sounded so weird and distorted, it was coming from right outside. I began to slowly approach the front door before stopping. I then went to go take a peek out the window just to be sure what it was. All I saw was pitch darkness, except for the faint outline of a figure standing by the door. At first I thought it was a man, but then I saw that this thing had horns, like some kind of demon. I'm not sure how, but I swear this thing was probably looking at me. Then I saw the figure shift before a different voice came from the same source. Let me in, Daniel. At that point, I ran throughout the house making sure everything was locked down tight. I then ran into my room, covering myself in a blanket and I shivered until sunrise. I'd never been so scared again. Easter came and went, although the whole time I felt as if I was being watched. When we left my grandmother's house, there in the tree line I saw something. It was standing seven feet tall, and it was covered in a mess of dirty black hair. Though it was built like a man, it definitely was not one because men don't have heads like goats. I 
haven't told my family of this encounter, but I'm just glad that I hadn't opened that door, because if I did, I wouldn't be here to write this. I'm still filled with concern for my grandma, because I wonder if that thing has been haunting her this whole time. Was that thing the source of the strange noises she's been trying to warn us about? Flying Humanoid by Ariel E. I live in Jackson, Missouri, out in the middle of nowhere, and unfortunately, this is a true story. It's the most I've ever been scared in my entire life. It was 2014. I was 14 at the time. It was the middle of summer break, and it was about 11 o'clock at night. My mom came into the living room where I was just chilling and asked if I wanted to ride with her out to the water district to pay our water bill. I love going out at night, especially on random drives, so of course I told her I'd go. We piled into the car and we headed out to the water tower. It was pitch black that night, except for the shining of the moon on the road. My mom, my sister, and I we're talking and having fun until we reached the water tower. Just so you know, I'm a big baby when it comes to the dark. I'm terrified of it, especially where I live. Anyway, we got to the water tower. The moment I opened my door and stepped out, I heard weird sounds coming from the direction of the tower. Immediately, I told my mom what I was hearing, but she thought I was pranking her or getting scared of the dark, she knew me pretty well. I continued to step out of the truck, albeit more slowly. Then I walked to the door to slide the envelope in it. I ran back to the truck as fast as possible. When I made it back, I slammed the door open and shut. My mom was laughing at me as she backed out of the driveway of the water district. We were turning onto the highway when all of a sudden, a massive shadow flew right in front of our truck. Whatever it was, was like eight feet tall with a wingspan of 10 feet. I mean, it was huge. The quick glimpse I got showed me that it was gray in color and even scarier. Its body was shaped like a man. We watched the silhouette fly back up to the tower as it came back down. It was flying slow and close to the ground. As we watched it in disbelief, it was like time slowed down and the world stopped for a couple of minutes. All the while, we stared at a creature that simply couldn't exist. Before I knew it, my mom and I were screaming and she floored the gas pedal. She had me looking behind us to make sure the thing was not following our vehicle. We were in shock and my sister didn't see it because she had been on her phone, but she had heard us screaming and was beginning to panic because of it. When we pulled into our driveway, we all ran inside at top speed. I didn't sleep a wink that night, and I even cried a bit. I'm still terrified of that water tower, and I swear I'll never go back there at night. I found out that a conservation area is out there, and it's probably where the creature lives. About a year later, I caught an episode of Monsters and Mysteries in America, and it was about flying humanoids. I automatically began to tear up as I saw it, stories about creatures that matched what we saw almost perfectly. I ran to tell my mom about it. The sighting was in the Ozarks in Missouri, and for those who don't know, the Ozarks are about four hours away from where I live. The men in the show described exactly what we saw, the gray color of the man, the height of the creature and the wingspan, the humanoid shape, the flying in front of their car after having come down from a great height. I'm sure not many people believe us, but that's fine. Believing a story or not doesn't make this creature any less real. The Beast of Pope County from Salaried Second. 
The town this occurred in was more or less the size of a village. The encounter happened back in mid-October of 2016, as a friend and I were out deer hunting along the ridges north of Hector, Arkansas. We had several cattle deaths before the sighting, but we'd mainly chalked it up to coyotes, or koi dogs, roaming the property, as it was next to the Ozark WMA. This wasn't uncommon. Livestock deaths were expected during the fall, due to the high amount of predators in the area. My friend, Levi, who was like a brother to me, and I had gotten out of classes early, so we rode out to the ridge that we call T-Hill to check my family's cattle and maybe hunt some game that evening, if we saw anything. Usually, the cattle would be grazing, and you could spot deer around the fence lines, which bordered the hardwood flats. Everything seemed normal that evening, except the cattle. They weren't in their normal area out on the top of the ridge. Instead, they were hiding in their lower thickets, watching a cow pace around one of the streams that trickled down the ridge. Now, these streams were never over six to seven inches deep, and that was only if we had a downpour. I kept the cow at bay while Levi drove his ATV a little closer to the stream before waving me over. In the stream, there was maybe a two to three month old calf. It was dead. But it hadn't been mauled like it would have been if coyotes had killed it. We were very disappointed. Maybe it was too weak and had drowned in the shallow water of the stream. A few days later, we had the weekend off and went hunting along that ridge. Levi managed to harvest a good-sized deer, and I was helping him drag it out. This is when we saw it. This grayish-colored beast stood up from a bramble thicket in front of us, and it let out a low and deep rumble. Levi was five foot ten and I'm around six foot two, but this thing still had at least a foot in height over me. Instantly, we both grabbed our rifles and fired at it. The beast stumbled, then screamed. I swear I saw blood bubbling from its chest then. It didn't drop though. Rather, the beast ran screaming through the brush and off through the ridgeline. We're not tracking that dang thing, Levi said as we hurriedly dragged his deer to the trail, then hastily loaded it on the ATV before peeling out of that area. Not long after this, we graduated, and I moved away. Levi and I talked about the event several times after, but we always chalked it up to a bear that we spooked. But that's not quite right. I remember the thing having a canine-like face as it rose, and black bears aren't gray. Wendigo of Missouri from Jin. I cannot recall the exact time of this event, but I think I was about 12 years old then. I was with my family at the Lake of the Ozarks in Missouri. We tend to go out there about every two years, pretty much a family tradition. So one year while we were there, we went to a different spot than usual. Normally, we would stay in a rental condo by the lake, but this time we decided we'd go camping instead. Of course, me, being afraid of the woods, freaked out a little bit. I absolutely despised thick woods, especially ones that could potentially consist of bears and other wildlife. When the day came for us to leave, I said goodbye to my pets and my friend who was going to care for them while I was gone. I got in our car, waved goodbye, and we drove off. About two hours into the drive, I fell asleep. When I woke up, I heard the car coming to a stop. We'd driven into a gas station practically in the middle of nowhere. Everyone was going inside to use the bathroom, but me, on the other hand, I stayed in the car. As I lay there in the passenger seat, a wave of unease set over me. I looked out the window of the car and I saw this tall shadow just disappearing into the trees. I figured it was some sort of moose or bear minding its own business. About three hours later, we'd finally arrived at the campsite. I got out and saw that we had an amazing view of the lake and the mountains around. We all helped unpack the luggage we'd brought with us. Since it was already dinner time, we sat down together at a metal bench next to our tent, 
while my aunt and my mother cooked us all a meal. As I sat and waited for the food to get done, I noticed a cute little rabbit by the forest line. I smiled, watching it chew on some grass, but with a blur, a tall figure passed over the rabbit, and the rabbit was gone. It happened so fast, I was oblivious to what that thing was, but still I excused it like before. Maybe it was a bear, even a hawk? Heck, the rabbit probably just ran off. I turned back around to eat and didn't mention this to anyone, mostly because they probably wouldn't believe that the thing I saw was that fast if I'd seen anything at all. Later on, after dinner, we all sat around the campfire telling scary stories. When it came time for my turn, I had no ideas, so I excused myself to my tent to go to bed. Honestly, I really was tired from that five-hour trip. As I lay on my air mattress, something smelled absolutely horrible. I began looking around the tent, and to my horror, I found a dead raccoon resting behind my mattress. I yelped, trying to get away from the dead thing. I went back out to the campfire to tell my mom about this raccoon. She decided to use some gloves to carry it to the trees. After this occurrence, I really didn't want to sleep anymore, in fear that whatever had killed the poor thing was still nearby. I did eventually fall asleep, peacefully resting my overwhelmed mind. What must have been around half an hour later, I suddenly woke up and I felt as if someone was watching me. I noticed that all the sounds of nature sounded muted. I looked at the tent door and realized it was open, but it hadn't been before. At first, I was pretty scared to look, but after gaining some confidence, I glanced outside the tent. What I saw, I will honestly never forget. Standing there was a dark figure, probably around eight feet tall. I looked up at its face, but only saw a deer skull and antlers. I screamed as loud as possible, trying to alert everyone about the danger. I kept screaming, not letting my eyes off the creature. After about five seconds, it ran off into the forest. In that instant, my parents came running out of the tent with the most worried looks on their faces. I was in tears at that point, breaking down into their arms. The next day, we immediately left that place, returning home. Of course, I didn't tell my parents what I actually saw. They would never believe me. Instead, I said that a bear had been trying to get inside my tent. Let's just say I'm never going there again. At least, not any time soon. The Creature on the Battlefield From B. Dowd, 62 I'm a 19-year-old guy. This story happened on a national battlefield. To be specific, Prairie Grove Park in northern Arkansas right in the Ozark Mountains. On an early December weekend, I and hundreds of others would participate in a reenactment of Prairie Grove, Arkansas. My group of friends were all around my age and would always try to have fun on these weekends, either going to a dance, drinking, or just walking around during scheduled times. It's a lot of fun. That weekend started as usual. Friday, everyone showed up and I met with all my friends, after we got dressed and formed into a battalion, we marched off to our camps. Nothing eventful happened Friday night. Many of us were just tired from driving so many miles. We were sleeping in big tents Friday night to keep warm from the icy winter winds. Saturday started off normally as well. We did a battle for the spectators, chilled around camp, and enjoyed ourselves. Come Saturday night though, that's when my life would be on the verge of death. After our mock battle, they sent my battalion into picket, which is taking the post and watching for the enemy. When it was my company's turn for picket duty, it was around 1 a.m. This usually lasted about an hour and a half. My partner and I were stationed on the farthest end of our line of pickets. Our left side was unprotected. Around 30 minutes in, we began to hear footsteps to the left side of us. We gathered our rifles and kept alert for any enemy pickets. After 15-ish minutes, we didn't hear anything and we let our guards down to rest. I lit my pipe 
and I began to relax. Then, all of a sudden, we heard a scream coming from behind us. Then there was another scream in front of us. Something was running through the tall grass we were guarding. We could barely see what it was. What we could make out was this large, dog-looking shadow illuminated by moonlight. We called out to the other pickets to fall back to our officer, but before I could begin the return, a huge rock was thrown at my back from behind me. It hit me, and I fell down, the wind taken from my lungs. I could see my partner running while I gasped for air. As I looked over to where the rock could have come from, I was left frozen in fear. This seven-foot-tall black creature was standing in the tall grass in front of me. It was a pale, rugged thing with black eyes, a slit for nostrils, and a smile as big as its head. Its arms were far longer than they should have been for its size, and its claws were dripping wet with what appeared to be blood, and I could only imagine where that blood had come from. After a few very long seconds, it took a step forward. I gathered my mind and courage and reached for my rifle, hoping to defend myself with my bayonet. I stood up, legs trembling so badly I felt I was going to pass out. I ran and ran as fast as I could then, but I could hear that creature following behind me. With every step it took, it made loud, heavy thuds. I could feel this thing's breath on my neck too. Too scared to turn around, I kept running until I reached my company. I nearly cried when I got there from the adrenaline rush and terror. They were wondering what the heck was going on. Apparently, they didn't see or hear anything that was chasing me, but I was certain that I saw fear in my partner's eyes. That night, they didn't make anyone else go on picket duty. I didn't sleep that night either, scared that the creature would come back. I stayed close to the fire, not for warmth, but security. When dawn broke, I found that I had three six-inch long cuts in the back of my coat. After getting the courage to go back to the scene, with a few friends of course, we found a dead deer where I'd been stationed. It also had three long cuts going across its body. I decided then to just pack it up and leave. The drive back home was a silent drive. All I could think about was that creature. I didn't get much sleep the nights afterward too, putting a toll on my grades. I barely passed the semester due to sleep deprivation. I decided to take a six month long break from reenacting just so I could gather my confidence to sleep outside again. I know one thing. I will never return to that reenactment ever again, fearing that what I met before will not be so merciful next time. They told me they'd leave you alone. I remembered this story when I was driving home late the other night, and just thinking about it really creeped me out. This didn't happen to me, but I did hear it from my ex-girlfriend's grandma years ago about a friend of hers. We'll call her grandma, Grandma Z. Z worked as a therapeutic masseuse at a spa in a nice little town in Northwest Arkansas. To give you a bit of an idea of what kind of person Z was, she lived in a little stone cottage with a shrine to a Hindu holy man as its centerpiece, and she carried pipe tobacco in her Volvo to sprinkle on roadkill. Now, she claimed it was a Native American ritual to help ferry the animal spirit into the next life, or something along those lines. She was a nice enough woman, but obviously a bit eccentric. That being said, she seemed sincere and a little more than creeped out when she told us her story. Another masseuse that Z was close to at the spa, I'll call her M, arrived at work one day in the middle of the week in a haggard state. M was a young woman in her early 30s. 
She was friendly, and most of the time she had a bubbly personality. But on that day, she was aloof, downcast, and had bags under her eyes. Z noticed this the moment she walked in the door, but with work to do, she waited for a better time to ask M if everything was okay. When lunch came around, Z approached her friend and asked what was wrong. M brushed it off initially, saying that nothing was wrong, that she was simply tired. But Z persisted. M began to tear up then and started to sob. Z embraced her and told her it was going to be all right, that she could share what was on her mind if she needed to. M's sob subsided a little, and she began to speak, but then stopped. What she had to say, she told Z, was too crazy, and Z would never believe her. Z told M that she'd be surprised at what she may or may not find believable. So M composed herself a bit, and then began her story. M, her husband, and young son lived in a house about 20 miles outside of town. The house and the property were beautiful, essentially the couple's dream home. It included plenty of acreage nestled in a valley in the Ozark Mountains, and the house had a huge picture window in the living room, overlooking the valley and the forested mountains beyond. The night before, she'd awakened around 3 o'clock a.m., Nothing had startled her awake, no nightmares, no having to pee, but, but something had definitely awakened her, something that she wasn't aware of just yet. She lay in bed in the dark for a while, listening in the silence, trying to go back to sleep, but she couldn't. She then carefully rolled out of the bed, trying not to wake her husband and then she made her way through the dark house to the kitchen for a snack. As she walked through the lightless living room, she looked out of the picture window and froze. There was something standing on the deck just outside, a small silhouette outlined in starlight. She studied the shape in wide-eyed fear as it stood motionless on the deck overlooking the valley. It seemed to be looking up. Her shock turned to concern and confusion when she realized what the figure was. It was her eight-year-old son. She quickly flung the sliding door to the deck open and wrapped the boy in her arms, asking, Are you okay, honey? What's wrong? What are you doing out here? I'm... I'm looking at the lights he said. Then he pointed out into the clear night sky. She followed the direction of his finger and saw several orbs of soft red, blue, and orange lights hovering over the valley. They were like bright stars at first, but then they moved slowly, deliberately into a formation. First a line, and then a cross, and then a diamond, and finally something that resembled the Big Dipper. There was nothing natural about their movement. They could not be shooting stars or aircraft. They weren't moving like that. It was like they were some sort of signal, almost as if they were communicating with something or someone. Im released her son from her arms and stood up hypnotized, staring at the lights too as they changed formations and pulsated from dim to bright and back to dim again. Her son tugged on the hem of her nightshirt and said that he was cold. She broke her trance and took her son quickly by the shoulder, leading him inside impatiently. She slid the door closed behind her and locked it, doing her best not to look back out over the valley. She closed the blinds on the big window in the living room and ushered her son into her bedroom to sleep with her and her husband with the lights on. M stopped talking and looked up at Z, who looked back at her with eyes widened in amazement. She began to sob again. Do you want to hear the really crazy part? 
the reason why this is so, so scary? Z's mouth hung open as she thought about how to respond. Before she could reply, M continued. Her father was a physicist who'd worked at a government lab in New Mexico. He was never able to tell her what exactly he did for reasons of national security, so to say. While working in the Southwest, he'd fallen in love with the region's harsh but beautiful mountains and desert landscapes. After divorcing M's mother and retiring early with a handsome government pension, he bought a small ranch in Arizona. In the summertime, M, then a young girl, would stay with her father at his ranch. It was a very remote property, part of its allure for him. It was in the foothills of some mountains in the desert, but it had access to a water source, and there was a small pond back behind the ranch house, overgrown with tall cattails. Early in the afternoon one summer day, M's father left the ranch to run some errands in the nearest town. It was a brutally hot day, and M did not want to ride in the stifling hot truck, so she begged her father to let her stay so she could swim in the pond. Reluctantly, he agreed. Once her father had left, M put on her bathing suit and made her way down a small path of hot rocks and sand to the pond behind the house. The sky was almost impossibly blue in the clear, torturous Arizona summer heat. A slight breeze rustled the reeds and scrub brush, but it was otherwise silent as if all the animal life had perished or gone underground to escape the relentless desert heat. As M rounded the bank of cattails that obscured the pond from the house, she froze at an unexpected encounter. Three tall beings were standing on the opposite side of the pond. They were all identical and stood facing her as she came into view, as if as if they'd been waiting for her. M couldn't move. Whether that was from pure fear or something else, she couldn't tell. All she could do was stare in horror and disbelief at these things. They stood about seven feet tall, each one completely indistinguishable from the other, as if they were clones or triplets or mirrored images of each other. They were vaguely humanoid, two unusually long and skinny arms that ended in spindly hands with long fingers, two long and thin legs, slender, elongated torsos, and skinnier necks. Their heads were long but proportional to the height and build of these things, whatever they were. They had ruddy tan and completely hairless skin, and wore what seemed to be blue, skin-tight jumpsuits. But the strangest and most awful aspect of these things were their faces. They were completely featureless save for the eyes. No mouth, no ears, no nose. Just two somehow human-looking, but somehow not human-looking, eyes set into the blank, tanned plane of their faces staring dispassionately and motionlessly at him. She blinked once and soon found herself lying on the floor of her father's living room, right on her back. She was wrapped in the towel she'd taken with her to the pond, as if she'd been swaddled in it. The sun had gotten significantly lower in the sky. She could tell by the way it slanted in through the yellow blinds of the windows at a long angle. She sat up, confused, and beginning to panic. She heard the ticking of the old grandfather clock and looked over at it. The time read 5 p.m. She'd somehow lost nearly three hours of time. How? How is that possible? How had she even gotten back to the house? Just as strangely, she was completely dry. Not a bead of sweat had gathered on her even though her father's house lacked air conditioning and was sickly hot. Her father arrived not long afterward, pulling his truck down the long driveway of the ranch. When he entered the house with his sack of groceries, he found him in a state of distress. 
She told him in a panicked frenzy what she'd seen, what had happened to her at the pond, how she'd somehow lost three hours of her life. The old physicist stared coldly into the distance, waiting for his daughter to finish the story, then told her, but they told me they'd leave you alone. M was shaking and began to cry again. Z held her and she buried her face in Z's arms. That's why I'm afraid, she said. I'm afraid that they came back for my son. The Beast in the Snow From Curtis S. Location, Northwest Arkansas, Ozark Mountains. This story begins like a lot of others. It's a tale of me and my high school buddies. For privacy reasons, we'll use their gamer tags from back then. The actual location of this tale will not be given. It happened back in late 2006, early 2007, when one of the largest snowstorms hit Northwest Arkansas. We had 32 inches of snow and five inches of ice bearing down on us. There were over 85 fatalities from the storm alone and over 500,000 people without power. It was very cold and very wet, but as many teenage boys do, we got bored and we all got together deciding to go check around to see if we could help people stuck in the snow. We checked on everyone's families that we knew to see if there was anything we could do to help. After some time of this and helping a few people out of the ditches, we again got bored and decided to go and check on G. Dilly's father, as their house was not in the greatest shape. His dad was kind of a lonely hermit. We sat down and talked with him for a while. He would kind of remind you of Deckard Kane from the Diablo games. It was always a sit down and stay a while kind of thing. It was never a fast visit for us boys. However, after a few hours of talking, dark started to set in. The temperature started dropping even more, and as I said earlier, most people were without power. It was very dark. The town looked like something out of an apocalyptic movie, all but abandoned. We tried to get out of the driveway to no avail. After 30 to 45 minutes of trying, we decided that it was best we stay there for the night. I called home to tell my family we were staying there. As the night went on, we started to go stir-crazy, just sitting around and doing nothing. So Timbo and I decided to go outside for a smoke, as Advent and G. Dilly stayed inside. As we smoked, we talked the other two into going down to a place where we all hunted and camped. Now, mind you, we all grew up around here. Timbo and I had the most outdoors experience. We were very avid hunters and fishermen. We loved to go camping. Advent and G. Dilly, however, were more of the inside gamer type, but they still knew their way around the woods. We grabbed our rifles and a shotgun from the truck, and we headed off. We passed one of our many camping spots we used that was on G. Dilly's land. As we walked into the dark and cold through the very thick woods past G. Dilly's house, things started to feel off to us. It felt like we were being watched. The whole you're now the prey feeling starting to set in. We chalked it up to the bitter cold. We continued farther into the woods. Looking back on it now, we probably should have turned around, not knowing what dangers awaited us in those woods that night. As we passed our old, most used campsite, we started to get into uncharted territory. That was the goal, though, to test ourselves against Mother Nature. We kept pushing on through the snow and roaring, freezing winds. We went into the pitch-black darkness. As we walked, out of nowhere, we heard the sound of a breaking branch. We spun around to nothing but darkness and a low, guttural growl. The sound made the hair on our neck stand straight up, and we felt it in our very cores. This was no longer an adventure, but survival. 
We quickened our pace, but to no avail, we ended up falling down a steep, deep gorge. We tumbled all the way to the very bottom of the gorge. Must have been around 40 feet. After that, we picked ourselves up, collecting ourselves and our belongings. We looked up then, and we saw something moving around at the top of the hill above us. It was a big, dark figure moving from tree to tree. As it moved around, we noticed that sometimes it moved on four legs, and at other times it only moved on two. We all decided that we were now at a disadvantage to whatever figure was above us on the top of the hill. At that point, with all of us being cold, tired, and hurting from the fall, we decided to find somewhere to set up camp. We walked a little ways down the gorge and found a riverbed. We decided to set up camp there. There was a four-foot drop there. We laid fallen trees over the top of the riverbed. We then gathered up evergreens and snow and put that on top of the fallen trees. We placed our fire a couple of feet outside of our shelter in the riverbed. We thought that if we built a fire, it may help to scare away whatever figure it was we'd seen, and we probably stood a better chance with the light from the fire. We then sat around the fire for a while. We thought everything had calmed down then. Timbo and I sat inside the shelter. Advent and G. Dilly sat on opposite sides of the riverbed by the shelter. We were all still on edge from what we saw. We talked about it all. At one point, I got up to relieve myself. Timbo decided to get up and add more wood to the fire. I had my back turned away from all of them. Suddenly, Timbo was startled by a possum which had jumped over the woodpile. He shot at it and killed it. As the gunshot rang out, it startled the rest of us. After we realized what happened, we started cracking jokes at Timbo, calling him the Great White Hunter and Possum Slayer. Then we saw it. It was watching us from the distance. Our laughter quickly faded away to fear, the boys noticing me staring off behind them. They turned around to face the creature. We were face to face with its big red eyes. The thing crouched down by a tree, still easily five feet tall. It had a large body and a long canine-like face. It had huge, long, razor-sharp teeth, too. At that very moment, it seemed like time stood still. Seconds felt like hours. Total fear hit us all. This creature stood up, fully towering over us. It was well over seven feet tall. I shouldered my rifle as a roar that seemed to shake the earth filled the air. I fired my 303, hitting it in the chest. Timbo's 30 30 hit its center mass. There was no way this creature could have survived this. As the air settled and cleared, we thought we were about to see this thing lying on the ground. But there was nothing but some deep red stains on the ground and tracks leading away from us. We followed those tracks into the darkness, adrenaline coursing through our veins. We chased it, not sure if it was from fear or shock. The idea of it going after someone else, or one of us when we weren't prepared, made me paranoid. To this very day, I don't know what made us go after it for sure, but we did. We went through hills and gorges, following these tracks and red stains. I figured at any moment the monster was going to come lunging out at us. As we pushed through the bone-chilling cold, we soon realized we were making one big circle. So did that mean it was circling back to us? We really had only one choice. We knew we were never going to catch this thing in this terrain, and there was no open ground for miles. And if it was coming back for us, our best option was to dig in and prepare to fight. We put our backs together, eyes in every direction, using the snow and trees for cover. We waited and waited, listening for any sound, looking for any sign of movement. But it never came. We stayed quiet as much as we all wanted to talk. Right before the morning sun shone in the sky, we did suddenly hear one long high-pitched howl, which seemed close, like it was just around the next bend. It was like it was telling us we might have won that skirmish, but the battle had yet to come. Maybe it was just the sound of defeat. 
we'll never really know. As the sound faded off into the mountains, we all sat there in disbelief until the sun was fully in the sky. Then we stumbled onto an old road and made our way back to G. Dilly's house. We were still not fully believing what happened that night. Everyone made a full recovery from the fall, but we never did really get over what we saw. On occasion, we do talk about it together. But this will be the first time any of us have shared the story to the outside world. We often wonder whatever happened to the creature. Where did it go? Were we the only ones out there to see it? Why didn't it finish its hunt? We may never know. Might have to get the boys back together at some point, go back down there someday and see what happens. I honestly think the only reason we're still alive has nothing to do with skill or being brave. I feel like it was pure luck. I look at the woods in a different light, and I watch and listen to everything. I've taught my kids to always expect the unexpected, and just because it's not in our history books doesn't mean it's not out there, or it doesn't exist. I know what I saw, and my friends know what they saw. My warning to you is to be careful in the forest. Always pay attention. Never get complacent, even if it's the woods you know like the back of your hand. It doesn't hurt to always be prepared for anything. Was it the Goat Man? By Regular Decaf My family used to live in an old trailer out in the woods in southern Missouri. We never had much money, but we did the best we could. Honestly though, I hated living out there. The place was run down before we even got it. Trash in the yard that wasn't ours, and leaky pipes that ended up rotting out in a few spots in the walls of the place. It always smelled of mildew, and the nearest neighbor was about three miles down the road. So I guess the only good part about the place was how quiet it was. Don't get me wrong, I am very grateful to my parents. They did the best they could with the money they made. Even after the struggling finances and shoddy living situation, my family had the most miserable time at that trailer. And I believe it was because of the goat man. Now hear me out. So many different events occurred that both terrified and traumatized my family that seemed to have, seemed to have no explanation. But after reading so much about this goat man on the internet, despite how unbelievable it sounds, I believe I may have found the answer to what haunted us so many years ago. The following experiences happened from 1991 to 1995. In 91, I was 11 years old. At the time, we had just moved in. Unemptied boxes littered the place, and a feeling of excitement and anxiety were shared amongst my parents and me. The place was a downgrade. My father had been laid off, and we were forced to move. So, when we weren't a bit excited about being out in the country for the first time in our lives, there was tension about bills or groceries and mortgage. All in all, I was happy with the move. I was just a kid. If there were trees to climb, I was fine, and the woods around the place were abundant with trees ripe for the climbing. I do remember the day we were assigned a chore list. I thought for sure it was one of those things they tried to enforce that never really held up like no more fast food or no more soda or no more staying up past 10. With that assumption, I was completely wrong. One of my new chores was simply taking out the trash to a makeshift wire bin about 20 yards from the house. Easy peasy, right? Well, I've always been a bit of a procrastinator. What I should have done during the day, I ended up doing just before bed. I don't think most people understand just how dark it gets out there away from the city, especially during a new moon. Good luck seeing just a few inches in front of your face. I stepped slowly off the rotting wood porch, massive trash bags sloshing around behind me. The fear didn't hit all at once. It had been with me all day. This was my problem. If only I had taken it out earlier. 20 yards. Without hesitation or looking behind me, I ran toward the makeshift dumpster. Every step of my own sounded far too loud. And for a faint moment, I thought I heard another pair of footsteps stomping the ground with my own. 10 yards. I assumed it was merely my active imagination, my fear running wild. 
but the first clomp of a footstep that was out of sync with my own confirmed that I was not alone out there and that I was not the only thing running. Five yards. I was already too close to turn back. The trash bin was so close. Going back now would result in me getting chewed out for being lazy or afraid of the dark. Apparently, these are bad reasons for not being able to do my chores. The clomping sounded closer. God, I could feel a presence just behind me. It sounded so close. The bin was close enough. I threw the bag in, hoping that it landed inside the wide opening at the top. It hit the edge of the wire, ripping the bag in tween and spilling its contents. Thankfully, they fell into the bin. Somehow not thinking about the presence I had just heard, I turned to run back to safety. I regret that split-second decision every day of my life. I wish I had circled back. I wish I had taken the long way to the back door, but no. I turned around to retrace those very same steps that had been followed by something. There in front of me, literally only inches from my face, was a creature about twice my height. It was covered in long, coarse hair that smelled of urine and soil. When I had turned around, the thing pulled its hand away, the hand itself that had been reaching out toward me. I saw five dirty fingers, black nails on the tips. I stumbled backward immediately, falling on my ass and crawling away backward. I never broke eye contact with the creature before me. It shifted, its dirty fur coat ruffling as it did. That's when I noticed the curled horns on top of its head. Before I could scream, the thing turned toward the forest's edge and bounded away. In my fear, my anxiety, I assumed that I had just seen some sort of weird Bigfoot. But the sight of its inversely jointed legs and cloven hooves assured me that this was something far different. Something worse. Oddly enough, eyes wide open, staring into those woods, I could only walk back inside the house, shutting and locking the door. Maybe I was in shock. I mean, I've heard, read, and seen people's supposed accounts of some strange beast walking across the road as they were driving. But Jesus Christ, something twice my size and probably four times my weight had reached out to me, tried to reach out and touch me. Sleep was something I could not achieve for a while after that. I tried to catch up on my sleep at school whenever possible. Needless to say, it definitely affected my grades. My parents never knew about it, as far as I know. I didn't bother to tell them. They'd probably just laugh at me anyway. I wish I was joking. I wish it was the only encounter with that thing that I had. About three months after that, which was plenty of time for me to forget that incident, to convince myself that it was just a terrible, realistic dream, my parents decided to go out one night for a date night. I was pretty excited. I loved being home alone. Nobody around to stop me from doing whatever stupid thing I decided to do, which ended up just being me playing Game Boy on the couch. They said their goodbyes, I love yous, and don't go into our bedroom unless you want to be scarred for life. You know, the usual parent stuff. The moment they shut that door, I grabbed my Game Boy and started blasting blocks on Tetris. Eventually, I fell asleep Game Boy in my lap and the TV still quietly playing in the background. Crash. It sounded like something big had just shattered into pieces. I jumped up, hazy and half asleep. It was silent. I've had dreams before that jerked me back to life after a loud sudden thud in my head. At first, I thought this was that, that I had just been dreaming and heard a thud in my dream. But it was a shattering sound. I sat there motionless, staring into the hallway just beyond the open kitchen. It stayed quiet for several moments later. After a while, I decided that it was nothing and started to close my eyes. I jumped up the moment I heard my parents' bedroom door open. The door itself was beyond the hallway, which was behind another door, so I knew something was coming. I just couldn't see it, not until the hallway door opened. I knew better than to wait for that to happen. Whatever it was, was coming quickly. I didn't have time to think. I ran to the sink, opened the cabinet below it, and hid. I barely fit, but luckily, I was able to shut the doors. To see the intruder, I left a crack in the cabinet doors. Not too much, though. I didn't want it to look obvious that I was looking through the crack. 
I heard the hallway door open. My heart ached with every beat. Never before have I felt so terrified. Someone was in the house with me. Some burglar or thief had broken in through the large window in my parents' room. Clomp, clomp, clomp. The sound was heavy and close. Those footsteps did not sound like the boots of a thief. In fact, they sounded familiar. Clomp, clomp. Before I could connect that sound to where I had once heard it, the sight of tall, hairy legs stepping onto the linoleum took my breath away. That, that creature from before, it was inside my home. For far too long, those legs did not move. It was right in front of the sink, just standing and waiting as if it knew where I was. Finally, the thing did move. It stepped heavily toward the living room where only seconds ago I had been sleeping. I tried not to think about what might have happened had I been asleep still. I could hear it breathing, sniffing the air. How could it not know I was there? Surely it could smell me. It just kept sniffing and walking around the living room. Now I could only listen. My vision was exclusive to the kitchen directly ahead. All I could make out were a few legs of the kitchen table. The feeling of hearing and not seeing, it was torture. The steps were coming again, loud, calm, everything I wasn't at that moment. It took every ounce of my strength just to hold back from screaming. For another treacherous moment, those demonic legs stood in front of me. This time, though, they stepped away quickly. Soon, those heavy steps faded away. I had no idea if that thing was out of the house, but I had to do something. I crawled out from under the sink and raced toward the hallway. I reached to close the door, and the moment I did, that thing's face, horns and all, emerged from the darkness of the room across the way. Slamming the door shut, I grabbed the kitchen chair next to me and lodged it under the doorknob. It didn't hold like they show in the movies. The moment that creature hit the door from the other side, the chair slid forward until friction finally worked its magic. Through the small gap in the partially open door, I could see nothing but the darkness of my parents' open bedroom. Suddenly, all was calm, quiet, yet I was more scared than before. I backed up to the end of the living room, where my bedroom door was. I couldn't move beyond there. I had to make sure that thing couldn't escape. If it did, I made sure I had enough time to escape into my room and lock the door. Hopefully, the lock would hold. Still, though, the door didn't shake, move, or jounce. The thing that had hit the door, it was as if it was no longer there. I waited for painful ages, and nothing. I slid down to the floor, weak and sore from adrenaline. I forced myself not to blink. I just stared at that door. Daniel? My mother's voice rang softly from the hallway. My back grew rigid. My mouth hung agape. Daniel, come here. Open the door, please. That, that wasn't my mother. It, it couldn't have been my mother, unless my parents returned home and crawled through the broken window in their room. It didn't make any sense. Maybe I was going crazy. Open the door. Open it now. Open it. Open it. Open it. Daniel, open it now. The voice grew louder and louder, becoming a low, rumbling shout rather than the sweet, melodic voice of my mother. Daniel! Another voice like the one before came from the front door. Get the door, hon. We got a little too many leftovers. It was my parents. I stood quickly, both thankful and afraid that my parents had finally come home. The moment I took a step toward the front door, I felt the floor tremble with impossibly heavy footsteps as the thing in the hallway ran back toward my parents' room. I ran to the door and opened it. There, my mother and father stood with several doggy bags over each arm. Oh, thank goodness. Now take one of these before she could finish. I was behind them, pushing them into the house. Once inside, I locked the door and reinforced the hallway door with another chair, like it would help. 
What are you doing? My father asked, placing the doggy bags on the table. He loved his Italian food. Somebody broke in. I stuttered a reply. I could tell by the look on his face that he didn't believe me. That is, until he really looked at me. I was shaking, staring off into the distance, barely able to stand. He suddenly got very serious. He grabbed the rifle from the gun rack in the living room, and then he moved the chairs from the hallway door. My mother held on to me as we both stood quietly, knowing how tense the situation was. Well, they didn't truly know. They didn't really understand. Even when my father found long, coarse hair on the broken glass of their bedroom window. They didn't know that there was no burglar, no thief, no, no thug. Something had broken into the house to get to me. Years passed. I became a high schooler. Girls became more interesting than Game Boys. Sooner than I ever thought, those traumatic events with that nightmarish creature disappeared from my mind. Maybe I was suppressing them to keep myself sane. Maybe I just honestly believed that that was the last of it. God, I was naive. My mother died 40 years young in 1995. She was a great mother, a happy woman, but a terrible eater. Heart disease was a terrible beast, especially for a short, chubby woman who refused to change her ways. My father and I continued to live. It was a quiet life. We ate healthier and we respected one another. The circumstances of my life made me stern and mature. A 16-year-old acting like a middle-aged man. Our only disagreements came when my father went to church. He'd go every Wednesday and Sunday, and he'd do everything in his power to try to convince me to go. I'd say no. I had my reasons not to believe in God. The God of the Christian Bible, that is. He didn't like it, but quietly he accepted my decision. It was a Sunday afternoon. He was getting ready to leave for the afternoon service. You know, it'd make you happier believing in something. He would always tell me. He had said that same thing that Sunday evening. Yeah, I know, I replied, trying not to sound rude. I just don't believe in that. He nodded and walked out. That evening was quiet. The fall trees reflected a gold hue through the window shades. It was nice and made the homework I was catching up on much, much easier to focus on. About an hour or two after my dad left, there was a banging on the door. I smiled. Dad, you forget your key again? The knocking continued. I got up, rolling my eyes. I'm coming, Dad. You gotta stop taking the key off your ring. Daniel, come here. Open the door, please. It, it was my mother's voice, spoken the same as I had heard it so long ago. I stumbled backward, choking on air that I simply couldn't catch. Daniel, open it, open it, open it, open it now. That dread from years ago flooded me deeper than before. This fucking thing, using my mother's voice to get to me. Disgusting, and my father was still out there. He could come home at any second. Go away, I screamed at the door but the knocking grew louder and more rapid. Get the fuck out of here! Stop it! Without realizing, I stood up and ran at the door. I have no idea what I was thinking, what I was expecting. I guess the idea of my mother's sweet voice being a most terrifying, sinister noise. It got to me. Because as I grabbed and began to turn the doorknob, I could feel the regret welling up inside me. Why did I turn that knob? In an instant, I opened the door. My heart seemed to stop, and a blinding light filled my gaze. Son? I flinched from the light and fell onto my knees. Are you okay? My father shut the car door, the headlights flicking off. He ran toward me, the memory of that night so many days ago fresh in his eyes. He had seen me like that once before. He picked me up and set me on the couch. He locked all the doors and grabbed his gun. 
I tried to fight that catatonic state. My heart beat wildly, slow, then fast, hard, then subtle. My father spoke again. Pack your things. I managed to look over at him. I know there was no burglar here that night. He wiped the sweat from his brow and swallowed hard before continuing. You weren't the only one who saw it. Thanks for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed the show, you can support us in a number of other ways. You can go to eeriecast.store to buy some creepy t-shirts or coffee mugs. Go to eeriecast.com to listen to and follow this show and our other scary podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Or follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails for more screams and memes. Before I go, be sure to send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.